My dear students, welcome to another exciting video lecture in which I'll teach you more about electrochemistry from chapter 20. In typical fashion, I want to begin by sharing with you a hilarious chemistry cat of the day. No, I'm not trying to poison you. Now finish your PB and jelly sandwich. Ha <laughs> ha. Also, I've got an interesting molecule of the day. Methanol, the simplest alcohol, whose structure is shown here, is widely used as a solvent, motor fuel, ethanol, denaturant, and most of all, a feedstock for manufacturing other chemicals. It was originally made by the destructive distillation of wood, hence the once commonly used name, wood alcohol. Methanol is miscible with water and with almost every other organic solvent. It is colorless, volatile, flammable, and poisonous. During Prohibition, many people died from drinking methanol-laced liquor. Methanol is an old chemical, but it still makes news. K. Rajeshwar and colleagues at the University of Texas, Arlington, recently developed a process that uses solar power to make methanol from CO2. Super cool. Here's an interesting story that's slightly dated, came out of 2013, but I wanted to share with you now because it's, well, at least interesting. <laughs> According to this ABC News article entitled, Can Homemade Booze Kill You? Which is dated March of 2013. Okay, it's a little old, but I thought it was at least interesting. It says, 79 Libyans died this week from drinking homemade spirits in the North African country, where alcohol is illegal. Libyan officials suspected that the homemade liquor contained methanol and said many of those who survived drinking were blinded, according to the Associated Press. Methanol poisoning is infrequent in the United States, but it can be deadly if it is not treated, said Dr. Donna Seeger, the executive director of the Tennessee Poison Center and a professional at Vanderbilt University. She said she only sees methanol poisonings a few times a year and that they're often not from drinking homemade liquor but because children get into things like windshield wiper fluid, antifreeze, and paint thinner. Skipping down, we read, there are two antidotes to methanol poisoning, fomepasol, which was approved by the US FDA within the past 15 years, and ethanol, which is a kind of alcohol found in safe to drink liquors, Seeger said. Before fomepasol was available, it was necessary to treat methanol poisoning patient with intravenous drips of ethanol, which yes, would get them drunk. There's nothing worse than a drunk two-year-old, said Seeger, recalling a toddler ought to be treated for methanol poisoning before Fomepasol was available. And I imagine that's probably true. Here's our lineup then. After today's presentation, or series of presentations covering the rest of chapter 20 in this and a subsequent video, you guys should be able to do each of the following things. First, know what the electromotive force, or EMF, also known as cell potential, is and how to determine it by using standard reduction potentials for half reactions. Second, use standard reduction potentials to determine if a reaction will be spontaneous or non-spontaneous. Third, use a redox reaction's EMF to determine its delta G. Fourth, use an electrochemical half reaction to calculate the mass of a substance formed during electrolysis and explain how rusting occurs. Please note, by the way, that we'll skip sections six and seven from our text. That's the lineup, so let's get started. Now, like water falling down a waterfall, electrons flow from the anode to the cathode because they have a higher potential energy at the anode than they do at the cathode. Hence, their flow results from the fact that they fall energetically downhill in this direction, anode to cathode. The energy difference between the two electrodes in a voltaic cell is called its cell potential, or E sub cell, also known as its electromotive force, or EMF. To illustrate this, I have a picture of a beautiful waterfall coupled to a battery showing that the fall of electrons happens energetically from the anode to the cathode. Now, if I wanted to, I could report the EMF of the following reaction, which is the oxidation of H2 gas. Notice that the EMF would be a number. However, by convention, published EMF tables only report values for reactions that go in the reduction direction. Such EMFs are called standard reduction potentials, or E0 sub red. <sighs> Never get tired of all this crap I have to teach. Thus, if we looked up this reaction's reduction potential, we would see it in this direction, where E naught sub red would be, you know, a number. <laughs> the E naught sub red value for this reaction, by the way, happens to be zero volts. This actually is very important. You see, we can't measure the standard reduction potential of a half reaction directly, because in reality, redox reactions occur with reduction and oxidation happening virtually simultaneously. So instead, we choose a reference reaction and assign its E sub cell to be zero. That reference reaction happens to be the reduction of H plus to H2, as shown here. Zero volts. With this reference point in hand, we can now determine the reduction potential values of half reactions. How do we do that? Well, there's a magical equation that says that uh, the reduction potential of a cell is equal to the reduction potential of the cathode minus the reduction potential of the anode. So if I run a reaction that has H plus getting reduced at the cathode and any oxidant of my choosing being present at the anode, I can measure E naught cell. 
Because the reduction of H plus equals zero, I can mathematically determine the reduction potential at the anode. This then gives me the reduction potential overall of any half reaction I want. Make sense? I hope. So here's a table of reduction potentials for various reactions. There are more from Appendix E in our text. You're welcome, if you want, by the way, to pause this and take a look at some of the examples shown. At this point, then, our previous equation, the one shown here, can be rewritten more generically as this one. The overall reduction potential for any process is going to be equal to the potential of reduction minus that of oxidation. In this relationship, we've dropped off the subscript cell to indicate that the calculated EMF doesn't have to refer to that of a voltaic cell. In other words, it could potentially apply to any redox reaction. Also, we've generalized the equation by replacing the terms cathode and anode, which apply only to voltaic cells, with the terms reduction and oxidation, once again allowing it to be applicable to any redox reaction, and not just that inside a voltaic cell. This brings us to a cardinal rule about electromotive force, or EMF. If the E-naught value of the following equation, equation 2010, is positive, then the reaction will occur spontaneously. If it's a negative, then it will not occur spontaneously. Now, I want you to pause this and make sure you memorize that. Positive means it will occur spontaneously. Negative means that it will not. Here are two other important details. First, coefficients are not used in calculations involving this equation. And second, we never change the signs of our electromotive reduction values, regardless of which direction the reactions are written. Got it? Good. Let's take a look at a problem. Which of the following reactions will occur spontaneously as written? Now, I'm not going to do all of these for you, but I will do a few of them. You're welcome then to click on the link here to a separate video, which I'll show you how to do a few of them on the board. Now that you've hopefully watched that video and grasped what we're doing here, let's take a look at another one, which is pretty much the exact same question, just a different set of reactions. I'll let you attempt these on your own. Now let's turn to a different question. The standard cell potential or E-naught cell for the voltaic cell based on the reaction shown here is what? Once again, I'm not going to do this one for you here, but will, if you click on a link here, show you how to do it on the board in a separate video. We now turn to a separate question that one of my former students posed that I thought was interesting. So I created an entire slide simply to address it. What about non-spontaneous electrolytic cells? How do they work and why would you ever use one? Well, let's consider this reaction. If you wanted to react sodium cation with chloride anion to form individual sodium metal and chlorine gas, Given the following data, that is the reduction potentials for sodium going to sodium metal and chloride going to chlorine gas, is this reaction spontaneous? We can see that to determine this, all you have to do is add these two values, negative 2.71 and positive 1.359. You'll notice that if you do that, you end up getting a negative overall value. Because it's a negative overall value, the answer is no. This process would not be spontaneous. And yet, there still exist electrolytic cells industrially that do this. In other words, they push sodium cation and chloride anion energetically uphill to form sodium metal and chlorine gas. Because you're going energetically in a disfavored direction, this is not a spontaneous process and actually consumes energy. So why would you ever do it? The answer is simple. You do it in a circumstance where you want to manufacture sodium metal, that is sodium zero, or chlorine gas. In such a circumstance, you could easily get sodium cation, chloride anion uh, from table salt and then push them in a way that costs energy uphill in the energetically disfavored direction to their parent elements. Because it's energetically disfavored, it is non-spontaneous. And in principle, this is how a non-spontaneous electrolytic cell works. That takes us to the end of this video lecture. Please stay tuned to the next one in which I'll continue and then finish teaching you guys about electrochemistry. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.